Okay. All the best. <laughs> Thanks. This is a dangerous five minute question. Anyway, after a 72 minutes of delay, I know that this will be more than made up for by the presentation. We're so happy to have Amina Bisa, who's in here today. The title of the talk is Exploring Structure and Reinforcement Learning to Mitigate Risk in Real World Financial Control Problems. And I understand financial control problems. I'm not sure I understand the rest of it. Um, Amin Mohamed Abusala is the Dean's Chief Assistant Professor in the Department of Applied Statistics Engineering. He earned his PhD in Artificial Intelligence and Operations Research at the University of Toronto. His research interests lie broadly in artificial intelligence and dynamic data systems. He enjoys applying theoretical mathematical concepts such as information geometry to develop new machine learning algorithms for a variety of practical, real world, dynamical systems applications. Uh, he uses the financial application to raise a challenging real world dynamic systems environment, which to advance reinforcement learning. Professor Gusla's primary research interest is improving reinforcement learning algorithms for solving and controlling dynamic systems by exploiting topological properties of time series data and partial differential equations. As a teacher, he likes to mix theory and practice by sharing both his research and his industry experiences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gusla. Thanks, David, for the intro. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Okay, David. How is better? Yeah, Better? Good. Thank you. So thanks everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, um, today we're gonna talk about exploiting structure in reinforcement learning to mitigate uh, risk in the real world financial control problems. So real life is dynamic and nothing stays there forever. Things change over time. Uh, sequential decision-making problems are everywhere in real life applications. There are many fields and methods for solving these sequential decision-making problems. So all these topics are well-studied fields for sequential decision-making problems. And I like to think about these topics um, as being on a spectrum between pure AI and pure operations research. Let's see how. So we have a spectrum where the amount of structure and prior knowledge in a given environment increases when we go to the right. That knowledge can be used to build models. So state-of-the-art AI is largely model-free, whereas operations research relies on models. Reinforcement learning is an AI technique for sequential decision-making that has been proven successful in domains such as game playing, but not in complex real-world environment. So our goal uh, was to investigate uh, the challenges facing reinforcement learning in real-world applications and develop a theoretical understanding and extend it so that it is useful for your world. Uh, in this topic, I selected portfolio management as a challenging financial application domain, just to improve reinforcement learning a bit. But this work is applicable to many application domains as well. So one of our most important findings is that real world reinforcement learning benefits from having more structure. But let's first define what is reinforcement learning. So RL consists of two components, an agent and an environment. The agent uh, learns by taking actions in the environment and receiving rewards as feedback. Through this interaction, we collect a sequence of states and actions. Then the probability of a sequence depends on the starting state, a model reflecting the previous state and an action, and the policy. 
The policy encapsulates the agent's learning on how to take actions in the environment. And the optimal policy is computed by maximizing the expected total rewards, which defines the value function. The value function is simply how good a state is for an agent to be in. Fundamentally, we can incorporate structure or prior knowledge into the input space, the reward or the cost function, and the model. There are three common approaches to RL. The critic or the value-based reinforcement learning focuses on the value function and has an implicit policy. You also have the actor or sometimes called the policy-based RL, which learns the policy with no value function. And we have also the actor critic, which learns the value function and the policy, thus combining benefits from both approaches. There are various trade-offs with these three approaches. So we worked on all three. So the current landscape of RL research in finance is such that we can cluster all previous work into our three main classes. The critic class, the purple color, the actor class, the yellow color, and the actor critic class, the gray color. So I have published three papers on this subject. So our paper one belongs to the actor class where our paper two and paper three belong to the actor critic. Here, I will only mention the major limitations of each class. Uh, the critic approach works fine, but only for discrete action spaces, like for instance, buy or sell. Uh, the actual approach allows for continuous actions, but suffers from high variance. The actual critic approach suffers from instabilities due to the different nature between the actor and the critic. And lastly, the model-based approach fails when the state space is too large and or the dynamic of the environment is simply too complex to be learned. So in our first paper, we took the initial steps uh, to apply RL to a, a realistic portfolio management problem. So uh, we identified 10 challenges for RL in finance. Due to these challenges, uh, conventional RL approaches do not work for finance, which means significant changes to RL are required. We present uh, four papers that address these issues. So the first paper, paper one, addresses issues one to four. Paper two addresses issues five to nine and updates our approach for issues one to four. And I found issue 10 to be one of the most intriguing and complex. So it became the focus for our work in papers three and four. Now let's briefly overview paper one. So our goal here is to allocate assets in a portfolio to maximize return and minimize risk, right? And the Markowitz theory of portfolio management is one way, I mean, to optimize this trade-off between return and risk. So most supervised learning techniques focuses on price prediction, but this may not be enough. Why? Because a prediction needs to work over long periods of time. It does not give us a policy for making decisions and does not take into account real world issues associated with executing our decisions. So using RL, we can reformulate the portfolio management problem from market prediction to creating an allocation strategy. So 
Typically, trading strategies based on price prediction have a complex workflow, as you know, and policies are developed independently from the supervised models. But in the RL setting, like here, no need for separate stages. Basically, we do not need to predict the expected future returns first and then use models from portfolio theory. Here, we naturally have an end-to-end an -end optimization. Uh, the prediction and the portfolio construction are jointly optimized, or let's say baked together in, in one single end-to-end -end workflow. So here, our RL agent learns a policy using a neural network for training. Here, we added a financial structure into the reward function by subtracting transaction costs from the returns, no matter what decision the agent takes, good or bad, we will always incur a cost in real life. We also use sharp ratio as a cost function to capture the, uh, the return risk trade off. These are difficult to optimize in machine learning because of their non-differentiable non and non-convex properties. So we had to customize uh, the neural network algorithm a, a bit. <laughs> then the Markov assumption makes the computations easier, but is not generally valid in financial problems that are usually path dependent. So in the gradient computation of the loss, we take into account K previous decisions using a chain rule to relax the Markov assumption where K is a hyperparameter optimized using our training and validation sets. For our data set where we made hourly decisions, we found K equals four or five to be the best. I mean, four or five times that backwards in time. So here, here, like in the top, we can see the training data for 10 assets over four years with 15 minute increments. In the lower left, we can see an example of portfolio allocations with hourly decisions for each asset. The red ovals shows the performance when the market dropped in 2015 and the agents moved the only few assets that were not dropping as fast. In the lower right, we see the performance of the top five configurations of hyperparameters compared to the market buy and hold benchmark, the black color. So our initial sets of modifications to the RL algorithm demonstrated the feasibility of multi-set portfolio management. Yeah, now we will talk about paper two, where we addressed some additional issues for more realistic portfolio management. Yeah, some people in portfolio management like to use the Markowitz model we discussed in the first paper, and other people like to use the Kelly criterion. Uh, these are, you know, different well-known frameworks in, for portfolio theory, both of which would allocate the portfolio uh, optimally, but from, I would say, different viewpoints, uh, given some conditions. And RL makes, if possible, to use these both to achieve better results than using either one alone. And I will show you how. So our work in paper one using the actual approach only with the Markowitz model exhibited high variance uh, in learning the policy. One way to reduce variance is to consider an actor uh, critic approach. So here we use the Kelly criterion for the critic only which has the effect of imposing more financial structure on the problem. So uh, in addition to the Kelly criterion I was talking about, which imposes the, a log return structure used to compute the financial growth, we added uh, equally weighted portfolio return as a baseline here. Uh, 
to incentivize the agent to be the market, which means like to generate alpha and not only having a positive return. We also added a covariance matrix to penalize uh, volatile assets and a max operator to incentivize diversification to better mitigate and systematic risks. Here in this slide, I use the notion of average growth and merged it with the concept of value function used by the critic to define what I call the optimal growth value function. Then I derived a geometric policy score for the critic. So basically on the left, we see the Markowitz viewpoint where one algorithm has much worse return than others, the green one. But on the right, we see the Kelly viewpoints where they have compar uh, comparable policy scores. This indicates that uh, any of these algorithms could make a bad decision and suffer considerable losses. So our score helped us to be more trustworthy for real world applications. And also can show us that like, if we just follow uh, the return only, it can be deceptive. One interesting result from this work is that some of our algorithm variations discovered common investment strategies. Here is an example where an algorithm mimicked the risk parity model. So our algorithm is on the left, the machine learning one, and the mathematical model is on the right. The y-axis are the investment decisions or the amount of portfolio weight for each asset. Now we will talk about paper number three. In this paper, uh, we addressed issue number 10 that deals with the partial observability, nature, and the non-stationary behavior of financial time series. So time series prediction problems highly depend on the observed historical time series data during the training. More specifically, we train our machine learning model using only one fixed historical time series, which can lead to overfitting. However, the fixed historical time series is only one particular realization of an unknown stochastic dynamical system. So the question is, can we train using more uh, realizations, even if you don't know the underlying dynamical system? So the answer is yes. We can use something called data augmentation and we conjecture that training with more realizations can lead to better learning under some conditions. So data augmentation is a way of manipulating our input data so that the learning algorithm can learn better and or faster by exploiting invariance. By the way, here, the machine learning task uh, is to perform cat image recognition. And obviously, we don't want our learning process or our classifier to be constrained by the orientation of the cat in the training data. So we usually augment our training data using rotated or translated and scaled images. But it is not clear what does data augmentation mean for time series. So can you tell me if these two time series are the same? And in which sense are they invariant? What does invariance mean for time series? Can the topology or the shape of time series be invariant? Can we usually, or can we even like measure this, uh, this invariance? Let's say if this is a time series and after applying a rotation, like what is commonly done in image recognition, is it still the same object or the same time series? So a general framework for fundamentally understanding why data augmentation works in machine learning has not 
being addressed uh, in the literature. And these are the fundamental questions we addressed in this paper. So given, given like a loss function, uh, how is data augmentation done in practice? Well, to start with, uh, here is the standard classical machine learning loss function. For instance, big L could be a mean squared error type loss. And obviously, we would like to minimize this loss. So in practice, we apply random uh, like augmentations and perform a stochastic gradient descent to minimize the loss function. This data augmentation process now can be viewed as not minimizing the original loss function, but actually minimizing this augmented risk under which we take this expectation over this uh, all the augmented sample space. Note that uh, here we have a theta in these equations which connects us to the concept of maximum likelihood estimator over the parameter space. We will talk about this shortly. So basically what we are looking at here is the standard arguments for regret bounds. So what is a regret bound? Uh, well, a, a regret bound measures the performance of an algorithm. And to give you an intuition, if you want to estimate a parameters in a random environment, let's say, we often give its mean value with a confidence interval, right? Uh, I like to think about regret bounds as a generalization of confidence intervals when estimating the performance of an algorithm. And so the term in the left uh, is what we call the, the um, um, generalization error, or sometimes simply the risk. And the term in the right is called the regret excess risk. So equation one is called the, the, the standard Radmacher bound. It simply tells us uh, how good is our parameter estimation compared to the optimal parameters. And the next line, equation number two, applies the same concept using now data augmentation. And from one and two, and some technical inequalities, we can derive three. As what you can see, the augmented Radmacher complexity bound is now governed by these uh, terms. Delta, which is negative term, as shown in the expression below. And this distance capital D, or more generally speaking, a divergence between our original data distribution and the augmented version of it. And now, if we take a special case, if these two distributions are exactly invariant, then the divergence between this distribution before and after augmentation goes to zero. And we can actually show that in this case, this Radmacher complexity uh, uh, just uh, can, kind of decreases because uh, delta is negative. Now, decreasing the Radmacher complexity simply means ending up getting a tighter bound for the risk uh, in equation two, which is a synonym of better learning. So now the question becomes, can we impose such a structure in the input space or the data so that the, the divergence term is zero or very, very small. So we want to understand more precisely what actually happens during learning in the parameter space. So we start by taking the difference between the mean squared error of our estimator, theta og, and the mean squared error uh, theta hat with this uh, for true parameters. And here again, we see this trade off we discussed earlier. So what you basically saying here is that this difference between the mean squared error of the augmented version of the estimator and the, vani uh, and the vanilla version is negative because of this various reduction here term. 
but we do have this additional bias as well. Again, depends on this distance or divergence capital D between the original and the augmented version of the data under the applied transformation F. Again, when this distance goes to zero, we can show that um, the difference of the mean squared error is negative, which means that the mean squared error of, the, of this augmented version is actually less than that of the original distribution. So this is a perfect example that demonstrates that learning is nothing more than minimizing distances in the primary space. So Batista et al. present different invariant distance measures for time series. And there is no universal distance that is perfectly invariant. So, so the choice of the distance depends on the context and, and the task to achieve. In our paper, we use the amplitude invariance. Here is one simple illustration of our recursive uh, interpolation method that we developed to overcome the partial observability and the non-stationary of the input training data. Let's say we start with a time series on the left and we use a formula to compute new values, x tilde. This example sets lambda to uh, 0.8, but in practice, lambda is sampled from a distribution. For example, a uniform distribution. And then we generate many of these uh, interpolated time series. So the important thing is that the difference between the generated series and the original one is bounded. And the bound depends only on the characteristics of the time series that are easy to compute, like, uh, let's say, uh, the maximum value of a given time series, for instance, and the number of time steps in the time series itself, a capital N. This gives us a way to control our divergence capital D and keep it small which leads us to define a notion of invariance or approximate invariance to be more accurate for time series. Uh, the results here I have shown you so far hold for something called the finite sample case. By finite sample analysis, I mean when we, we do training using a finite number of samples. But this theorem simply says that using some technicalities, the same logic holds in the asymptotic regime when we assume very large number of samples. And the main takeaway message to keep in mind is that our augmentation technique also reduces variance in the limit where the number of samples becomes very large. In this paper, we tested our approach uh, using two synthetic data sets and four real world data sets. In all cases, the learning performance with our augmentation techniques uh, outperforms the one without, uh, with no augmentation. So here we show results of two finance tasks, stock, uh, stock prediction using regression and portfolio management using uh, reinforcement learning. For all these charts, the augmented results are blue and the non-augmented one are orange. First, for the stock prediction example, we show the learning performance using three indicators. Uh, the proportion of the correct predictions, in the upper left figure, where the higher the better. The compound annual growth rate, CAGR, the upper mid, where again here, the higher the better, and the MSE, mean squared error loss, in the upper right, where now the lower the better. For the portfolio management example using reinforcement learning, the performance gap uh, between augmented results and the non-augmented ones increases with the training steps as shown in the bottom left. In this setting, 
like, a, like another example, ODEs can be thought of as generators that generate time series on which we are performing classification, let's say. ODEs with different parameters invoke different dynamical behaviors on their time series solutions. In the left plot for each class, we have two, we generate uh, multiple solutions using the corresponding ODE with different initial values. To make the learning task harder, we added random noise uh, to the solution generated by these ODEs. The right plot shows the training performance or the test accuracy curves using the original non-augmented time series data, red color, time GAN, which is the state of the art data augmentation technique uh, used in machine learning uh, on the green color, and our recursive time series augmentation, the blue color. As uh, we can see, our method outperforms both of the other techniques. Um, this is another example or similar one to the previous one where we consider a, uh, a trigonometric RDE solutions instead of exponential ones. Uh, in this case, the time gain results are worse than the non-augmented case. Our techniques outperforms both methods. Again, uh, in, in, so in this example, we have a binary classification task with prediction, the pattern of user movements in real world office environments from time series uh, generated by a wireless sensor network. So the left plot shows the data that have been collected during the movements of the users and labeled to indicate whether the user uh, trajectory will lead to moving to a new room or not. So we have two classes. In experiments, we use a subset of the data to form a small training set to challenge our algorithm. And the right plot shows that we achieved better and more robust test accuracy than the time gain and the non augmented case when using augmented data. And the last example here, we have the data set that contains time series corresponding to measurements of engine noise captured by a motor sensor. The goal is to detect the presence of a specific issue with the engine by classifying whether each time series has the symptom or not. We have class one and class two. As you can see in the left figure, it is very hard to classify the signals by only using our eyes. In, the, in our paper, we sampled 10 uh, or 100 time series, I think, from the data set to form a small training set, again, to challenge our model, and 100 time series for testing, so same amount. As shown again in right figure, our method out, outperforms the time GAN and the non-augmented case on, on the test accuracy. So the last paper, so in this work, we introduced the concept of the phase space, which is a mathematical tool used to study dynamical systems and added uh, some structure uh, there. So the phase space uh, allows us to study and to address the non-stationarity and the partial observability of financial markets in particular. Uh, but this work also applies to many other uh, dynamical systems based on time series data. Okay. So fundamentally, a one-dimensional time series is a, an observation of an underlying true dynamical system, which may not be known. So we lose information as we project the system into a time series of stock prices, let's say. Uh, the price is only an aggregation or a summary of more fundamental information in the original distribution. And augmentation is a technique that can be used to partially recover the lost information from the original distribution. 
So, so to verify our claim, uh, here uh, we use a specific case. Uh, and we are also leveraging three common data representations for time series data augmentations, or more accurately, I should say expansion recoding. So we have the first one called the GAF or GAF, which stands for the Gramian uh, angular field. It looks at the temporal correlation between pairs of points, just like from 1D time series, we can expand it into like 2D. Uh, then we have the MTF, which stands for the for Markov transition field, encodes a transition probabilities through time, obtained simply by spreading the transition matrix along time axis. And we have the last one, the RP, which stands for uh, the recurrence plot, which looks at the recurrent points. In other term, uh, we look for the states we are revisiting at different time points. So these images uh, make it ideal inputs for the use of convolution neural networks uh, in machine learning. So we know that uh, on the dynamic of a portfolio is characterized by an SDE, but we don't know what it is. So the admissible solutions of the SDE lie on the phase space that is also unknown. Uh, and intuitively, the augmentations give us constraints that allow to partially reconstruct the phase space within local coverings. But the question one should ask, uh, why, how do we know our new data representations give us a geometric information. Well, in our case, we use something called a persistent homology to show that our augmentations indeed uh, provide uh, geometric information about the manifold. And those local coverings, balls or cubes, put constraints on the phase space. Uh, hence, we say that we are imposing a structure in the phase space. Okay, so we computed the homology of our three time series of, uh, augmentations on our data set, which uh, corresponds to a portfolio of 10 stocks, let's say. We found the original one dimension time series, GAF and MTF, like, like exhibiting only H0 homology, which represent feature persistence. But we found that RP, the top uh, at the upper right uh, also exhibited H1 homology, which represent the features recurrence. I'm not going to explain today the concept of homology. All what I want you to know is that this concept is somehow connected to a field in machine learning called TDA, a topological data analysis, uh, which is an approach to the analysis of data sets using techniques from a topology. And this plot shows the persistence of H0 homology features of each augmentation and for each stock in our portfolio. RP, the red one, provides more, pers uh, like more persistent homology. But we found that the three augmentations, like uh, GAF and MTF, uh, uh, provide complementary homology as well. So we use all three. And to understand why imposing these structures in the phase space lead to better learning, we need actually to define the Markov decision process framework needed to formulate the RL problem. So let's now go to our problem formulation. And the MDP formulation consists of four components. The first one is the state tensor which represents the one dimensional time series for the stocks in the portfolio. We can just think about the price or some other features of the price. Uh, the portfolio weights are the actions taken by the agent. The transition dynamics is the unknown portfolio SDE and the reward function, which is based on total return minus the transaction costs. 
And the objective function is the future expected total return that we would like to maximize. And we compare the empirical objective function for the augmented and the non-augmented cases, like G north and G A. This leads us to develop two theorems. The first theorem states that the augmented policy reduces risk when compared to the non-augmented policy. And the second expresses that the augmentation enhances the quality of the gradient of the policy. Uh, the proofs for these theorems turned out to be very challenging, so I'm still working on, on them to make them more rigorous. Now that we have these two theorems, we proved four, uh, four propositions. So these propositions say that the augmentations lead to better returns, one, and less changes in the portfolio weights, two, which is beneficial for the cost transaction costs. It also shows that the augmented policy dominates the non-augmented one, and the augmented gradients converge faster, which is very simple efficient. And finally, around the optimality, the change in the feature extraction, phi, is uniform, which gives us a sensitivity measure about the features and local conversions to optimality. Uh, and our experiments showed that our augmentations improved performance for portfolio management. Here are some uh, training results for two RL models. The first one is called DPG on the left, which stands for um, deterministic policy gradients, and PPO on the right, which stands for uh, proximal policy optimization. In the plots, the blue lines show the results without augmentation. So can we use augmentation to improve performance? Uh, I mean, the answer is yes, minus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, and here we show which contributions are associated with which paper. And thanks very much for your attention. You want me to explain better what's the actual, what's the critique? Yeah, it, it, for example, level, like what we think about is, you know, like strategies that are, you know, either Markovian or non Markovian, or, you know, you should have the price process, the price realization, or other factors coming in to decide how you add it to practice. So all of these methods are coming from our uh, assumptions, and they're based on, on the MVP correlation and Markov is important. So all of them use Markov. So we have to think about how to rely on micro assumptions for problems that are non micro. But I will say about this later on. But the main difference between the actual and the critic is, and I will start with the critic and talk about any kind of jargon. Like the critic is just the value function, and the value function is coming from the development equation. And the value equation is like the AGG equation. Right? We have a value from the function and we're gonna find a solution from the equation. So once we have those value functions, which means how good I am or we are in this particular state, then I can derive a policy from it. If we have two, if we have like uh, two value functions and I want to maximize my value function, I will take the actual and maximize my value function. And that's how I will very nicely take the action. Which is finding policy. So here we first estimate the value function, so it's a value of a power of a critic, 
And once we got the highest value function, that's our goal. Find the actual maximizing of So it's a two step problem. First, find the value function, and then give me the actual maximize my value function. But the policy base or the actual base, there is no need for the value function concept. I just give me a function or a function that I want to maximize and step to the near term. So, what is the action or sequence of actions I have to take so I can maximize my loss or my reward or my return? That's like a, a more direct mapping between the state to the, to the policy for my actions. No value function. So like that value is going to be let's say traditionally um cumulative daily DNL. Now that's uncertain, right? So the value might be let's say the expected value of that line is some measure of the uncertainty, right? Yeah, of course. And you can define the value and then so we can uh, define our value for two different functions and uh, the problem the other function. So that's some of the electrical functions. And, and the other one, there's no uh, um, identification of value. Uh, no, but you just maximize the, I mean, we just optimize or maximize the loss function, uh, and then um, you can do direct whatever mapping, you know, across, and we want to like minimum or maximum cost. So I want to do the best sequence of action and the best amount of the loss function. So there's no mapping. So, so basically, I mean, uh, we want to value the program and we want to understand what we do. So much I have a question. I think about it. <laughs> um, so it seems like your data set in all cases is just the historical price set. Is that correct? Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah. I would take an example to have more illustrations. Okay, here we go. So we have a here the volume of 10 blocks, okay? Um, we have to divide our data from training and, and testing. It's, it's, all, it's all stock price data. Uh, it depends on which data. So for this one, it's all here, uh, I'm using like the uh, recruitment process, PT minus PT minus one other one example. Uh, in data number two, we have the flights, we have also, and we have open flow with the volume of our uh, So we have like a tensor, high dimension, and open flow, uh, low high volume. And also, uh, to the back of the assumption, we have also a window of like a chi time steps, and all of these five dimension and all 30 time steps, all of these like uh, multi dimensional tension. Is one sample as seen or the other things. So we take this mark of assumption by sticking on it because it's based on the MDP, but MDP is the mark of We can also build a new state based on this on the mark of the assumption. I guess my, my question has to do with it seems like you're illustrating a methodology here more than trying to really optimize what those are doing. And let me explain what I mean by that. If, if I were trying to use this as a tool, as an asset allocator, wouldn't I want to use a lot more information? Like, you know, people use machine learning for language identification, machine learning to integrate options data into stock selection. Um, I think there's a paper by the IQF presented last week about option signals for underlying assets, for example. And I'm wondering, is this expandable into that kind of multi-dimensional Sort of framework that relies on more than just the historical stock prices. Okay. I mean, this is like just like that. I'm sure that we can do something for making uh, the task of volume management, but uh, even the data and you know the features you want to put to the new state information, that's what you can do. So, for all of you, can define four components, you can do components. There's one of the states. For the price, for the term, for other features, task time uh, to build our state information. Then, what's the action space? Is it like a stream, like sell, buy, or do nothing? 
time, and once you have a winner, you can have an anticipated simulation. That right again, this has some evolution going in this like a uh, virtual environment. But once we are satisfied with the rules that are even more than a financial means, or taking the right strategy, then you can just like a uh, Save this case and then try to manage the kind of like somehow to do that. Well, but that's something I think that's sort of what you were wondering why you could generate such a rate. I mean, you could read that as something perfect, but that's what I was thinking of because of the success of these games. Right? You're right, but that's only one yeah. say, subfield required for the evolutionary force of evolution required to work. Change this policy from Dervish to Kapovich, which means to have trained AI algorithms. One moment, David. How can I open this? Oh, it's already open. Where? It's right here. Q and A. Ah, uh, yes. Model. And if the model is wrong, then the AI will learn something about the body model. 
So that's the interesting thing that I'm concerned. But if you are not sure about the model of the answer, it's better not to go there. And then if you are sure about the model, then of course it's a very hard task. So it's the most superficial and they're very quick and have a better performance. Uh, I think I, I didn't test it this yet with this study, but I know that at some point uh, generate uh, you just keep adding more and more on the stuff. That's why we have to set a subset of stuff. Because it's going to be hard to just plot one thousand stuff and then try to reverse and then make a lot of fun. So I'm going to take it aside. Then we just put it this way. I think not as fast. One of the questions that I want to say uh, what is the limit of how the resolution for any of the questions? I think it's one big difference. Thank you. 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 Example, example, ten million batteries for the meters and have a black box that you put the eyes of the common region and try to find it for the neural network. And the output of the neural network is the policy. Let me go here. Where were I think maybe let's see. Well, I'm not Uh, yes. Um, so let's say if you have a state where you are in examples, maybe the point of terms and future. So that's the whole thing. Like, 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 like the time space space. And we have a model of a black box with some parameters. And that's these input. And the output of the neural network. It's let's say for all the for portfolio management, we have one to three four stars. So it's zero point two five dots to five dots and of course it's five so which is like equally portfolio based. Then we have the interaction with the environment with this response and give them the reward. Like uh, they have a good return or bad return. If you did good, then I'm happy, it's bad, then I'm not happy. And then I'll adjust these parameters. Based on some gradient extent or extent, based on the topic, to change the part and then see the action. And then see uh, it's, it's the sense to the environment, it's going to be a real world, and then you can get back the reward, which is back to the chart of my action. If it's good, then I know that this model is good, but if it's bad, then I have to reach for the parameters. And that's the game. So playing many, many, many times to convert to find the right parameters. And then we can give up a good policy that maximizes my portfolio value. That's how it works. Okay. And the last part, which is 
Time, but uh, one of the slides. Let me show you the slides. Uh, so maybe I can keep this for for another talk. Maybe uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So basically, I'm, I'm sure that this expansion we're calling from is only one time series. Like we have time here. Uh, in my diagram, I have the value of my sensors, and, I can, and, and then the values that are outside of the diagram are correlation. So here we have all the value of my sensors, but then we have uh, the likelihood of moving from state one to state two. It's very low, and here the likelihood is probably not very high. So and the likelihood of moving from state one to state whatever is black, which is very low. So it's given something about the dynamics. And here we have something about the point of the state that have a little So it's much more richer information. But then why is this happening there? So my goal for this paper is to understand why it's there. You know, and then it's connected to something called like information journey. Because journey is equivalent to optimization in the polarity of space. That's something I will teach you uh, as so, and that boils down to optimization. And then we prove that indeed, with this expression, we call it having more information, we can give up like constraints. Let me show you. <coughs> so, so, having a, a more information, we constrain my search uh, in the environment space. But I have no. Uh, documentation for the uh, way then we have a louder space for example from so here to here but in augmentation we have a more uh, confined space structure and it's also not the description so I am not sure about the videos it's very clear it's something different but that's the situation which means adding more features will be translated in constraint in the environment that's all have a normal track value state, you need to better learn. So, so I can't talk about this yet. Another question? Just a quick one, I think. Um, can you mention like any kind of out of time testing or anything like this? Is that uh, sorry? Like out of time sampling and testing? <clears throat> like you design portfolios over a period of time. And Say outside of sample, but it's still <clears throat> predict the better portfolio. Yeah, so basically, uh, all of these are out of sample. Okay. Uh, let's say we train from, from this year of the train. Let's say we train from this year of the train. Let's say, and then we check. We train from this year of the train. So, what we did to here is all happening in the other sample. And the most to show that the, the policy or the action uh, taken by the thing makes sense. Like, for instance, here, when this stock, which is like Microsoft, goes up and going up, we will put all the stock uh, to zero and the stock is on the uh, going on the stock. It shows some sort of learning or whatever. Yeah. And which also makes sense that since they were not the performance moved from 
picking up the prices uh, as you drop. And all of them are going down, but it's just like putting all of them down and check the one part that will down the floor. <laughs> That's the really idea. Right? And these are all the samples uh, for all the reports. All right. Thank you very much. Coffee and our snacks. It takes 20 minutes after the back of the I was so, so, so tired. Very bad talk. Very bad talk. It's amazing. Are you sure? I'm not saying this because of me being here with you. I'll put it this way. Sorry. Ah, I don't know. Yes, better. Another question, can we? Oh, it's done. There were nine people actually. Nine. Yeah. 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 You can just stop or share. <laughs> and uh, and here. And, and from here. And, yes. and? Yep.